Hello again, year five. Right, so yesterday we looked at how World War One started and why it started. Today we're going to look at what life was like for the soldiers during World War One. Because obviously it was quite a big war and it did involve a lot of people. So again, we had two main sides with the Allies on the left and the Central Powers on the right. So the Allies consisted of Great Britain, France, Russia, Japan and Italy. Central powers consist of Germany, Turkey, or as it was called in the Ottoman Empire, Bulgaria and Austria-Hungary, which is quite a big country. Um, so again, this is the World War One map, World War One map. Um, what you'll hear a lot of is a reference to the Western Front. The Western Front is just where most of the fighting took place, and it, was, it basically went from Belgium all the way on to Switzerland. And it's where the Germans and the French, the Germans, the French, and the United Kingdom did a lot of fighting. So a lot of a lot of World War One happened on the Western Front. It also happened down here as well in Turkey, but a lot of it happened in this sort of area. Um, so on the Western Front, there was a lot of trenches. Um, now. Life in these trenches is quite interesting and what you're going to do is you're going to pretend to be a soldier and you're going to write a letter home explaining to your your mum, your dad, your family about what life is like during the time in the trenches. So these are some of the things that we need to think about today. So what was it like in the trenches? Have we done any fighting? Um, how many of your friends being killed and what do you eat and how do you sleep? So, um, so the tr a trench is basically, you think of it like a corridor, but in the ground, that's pretty much what it is. So you get the ground, you dig a bigger, you do a dig a big corridor in the ground and these, and these would stretch for hundreds and hundreds of miles across that. So if you think about how long these, how long these trenches are, it's quite a long way. Um, so and that was and that's what's created the front lines of both sides. So as you can see here, this was the front line. So you had the British army in Belgium, protecting Belgium, and you had the French army all the way down here. And the Germans were on this side. And then so the Germans were attacking from that side, and the British and the French from this side. Now, there are trenches all the way down this side and all the way down this side and the German side. So, there's a lot of trenches and hence why they call it the front line because that is where people stayed. In between, was called, in between the two front lines were, was what was called no man's land. As in, that's where you run across to get to the other side, but obviously not a lot of people made it over, sadly. So, uh, I'm going to share our website with you, and it is um, BBC Bite Size. I will put this website in the link as well, so in the description. So if you click on the description, this website will hopefully be down there somewhere. Um, so this basically goes through what a lot of it was like. So I will go through this with you, and you can also go through it in your own time as well, um, if you so wish. So. Trenches were long, narrow ditches dug in the ground, and it's where a lot of the soldiers lived. It was very, sometimes it was very muddy, very uncomfortable, and the toilets overflowed because obviously there was nowhere to empty them. Um, now, with this, it created quite a lot of issues. So, a lot of soldiers got sick because it was wet and cold all the time. They got a condition called trench foot, which is basically where your foot starts to rot away. And sometimes it had to be even cut off because it was that infected. Um, so there are many lines of German trenches on one side and British and French ones on the other side. And in the middle is what you'll call a no man's land. And they use that to attack and cross to each side. So um, already it's pretty grim. The conditions are pretty grim. Cold, wet, quite lonely at times, imagine it as well, um, and quite scary because you weren't quite sure when you were going to be attacked. So I'm just going to go through a couple of these things. So we're going to start off with the food. So you'll have often have 
meals that come out of a tin. Um, sometimes these went even hot because there was no way of heating it up, I, except if you're lucky enough to get a fire. But if it's cold and wet and damp, you're probably not going to get a fire. So at the start, they got quite a good lump of food because the, the war was quite new and they had plenty of money. As the war got on, the food got less and less and the quality of the food got worse and worse. So quite often you'll find soldiers that are going quite hungry. So at the start, they had lots of meat and vegetables to keep them strong. By the end, you would have stale bread, hard and tasteless biscuits and very watery stew that wouldn't really fill you up. Sometimes at the start as well, the soldiers would receive parcels from their families and that will contain things like chocolate, sweet biscuits, tin of sardines, like fish, that's to give you a lot of energy. Um, but as, as time got on, that sort of dropped off. So at the start, you had lots of lots of meat, lots of veg, lots of chocolate to keep you going. By the end, you had horrible stale bread where it's not, it's hard, it's 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 going mouldy, tasteless, tasteless hard biscuits that were horrible to eat soup because it was quite easy to make um, and watery stew so things things that really it would warm you up but it wouldn't fill you up so you were still left quite hungry um there was quite a lot of free time in this so what what would soldiers would spend time doing sometimes was to to either rest and sleep pick lice or insects out of their cost out of their uniform or write letters home, which is what you're going to do today. So already we know about what they what this sort of thing is they ate. Um, at the start, they ate quite well. Towards the end, they didn't eat very well. Um, so it wasn't, it, sometimes it wasn't very pleasant. Uh, I'm going to go for the rats next. So, because the ground was often flooded and dirty, and boggy and cold it was rats found it quite easy to get in there uh, now the bad thing about rats was they also spread disease quite easily as well so the rats often stole food and they would pass around disease between the soldiers so if they weren't getting injured from the gunfire up top they would of course get sick from the rats which wasn't ideal um they had a way to get rid of the rats that was just use dogs. Um, sometimes they would work, sometimes they wouldn't. Um, but because the trenches were quite a dirty place to live, rats, there were lots and lots of rats. So sometimes it was just sometimes it was just something you had to live with, which isn't very pleasant. Um, then you had a job that was being on watch, which if you can see from here, it's basically peeking over the top to see what's happening. Uh, this was a this was a very important job because you were one of the first people to see what was happening and see if anyone from the other side was attacking. Because it's such an important job, if you fell asleep, which if you're tired and hungry, you might do, um, there was a possibility that you'd be sent to jail or even sentenced to death because they thought it was that serious. So it was a very serious job that because you could see what was happening. Again, if you click on these, there are audio things. It won't work in this video, but if you go to the description, you can listen to them and you can read this at your own pace as well. Um, then you've got the sandbags. These are make, basically make the wall a bit higher. And also, if you're getting shot at, the bullets hit the wall and not you. Um, so these were sometimes full of sand, sometimes sort of earth and mud. Um, and they'll stack one on top of the other and create like a little wall and it will stop the bullets from getting in most of the time um so again it was someone's job to keep these filled up because obviously if one gets shot they're gonna fall out so these were these played a very important role uh, but i can't see it being much fun filling them up all the time um right the dirty work no one likes dirty work as you can see in this picture here this is a what it would look like it's very flooded it looks very cold it looks very dirty it does not look nice whatsoever um so the dirty jobs were jobs that people tried to avoid doing um, for obvious reasons that they didn't they didn't want to um do the jobs that was 
it was not pleasant in the slightest. So this included emptying the toilets, which as you can imagine, might be pretty grim. Um, especially after after rainfall, everyone tried to avoid getting that job. It also could include fixing the barbed wire, refilling the sandbags as I mentioned before, and making sure all the walls are strong and if any collapse, fixing them. Trench foot, again, which is what I described already, suffered for, well, if you're standing in water, like this person is up here, your foot starts to get infected and mouldy, and eventually you might have to be serious enough, you might have to have it cut off, which isn't very nice at all. Right, just gentlemen holding a periscope. A periscope basically is a long tube where you look for a top and through some, you have a mirror at the bottom, and a mirror at the top, and that lets you see what's happening up above without having to put your head up. We use it quite a lot on submarines, so you can see here, this person's looking for the bottom, and then, you, and then you're able to see what's happening at the top. And this is very useful, especially during battles. Um, so a lot of boats lying about, you can have a look, and you'll be protected. Uh, this guy here is having a little sleep. Now, they would often sleep during the day because they do the jobs during the night time. Um, so they, they, they work during the night and they use the cover of darkness to observe what was happening so they won't get spotted. So the only time, the only time of sleep was during the day. And that's when they do all the jobs as well. Um, the dog, as well as being used to get rid of rats, would also be used to send messages because obviously these tr the trenches would be hundreds of them, hundreds of miles long so these dogs could, send, could rapidly get there much quicker than you they would also they'll kill rats and they would also make sure messages get from one side to the other especially if you need reinforcements if you're being attacked um, and then you, you've got the guy writing a letter nice little letter obviously spare time you would write to your family to make sure that you're doing okay and that you're still alive and maybe you're asking some parcels can you send me this or oh, i would love this right now it would be amazing but obviously with, with rations that might be a bit tricky um you'd always have a bag and a rifle um it was called a haver sack which is there, and the rifle were very, very important parts of a soldier's personal kit. They had the rifle at all times in case they were attacked, and would have a bayonet on the end, so in case the bullets weren't working and they got too close, they could use the end of the, end of the gun to kill instead. Um, the haversack carried very personal items in there, such as a knife and fork, a mug, shaving kit, which I need to shave actually, um, and other things that were worn around the body as well, such as water bottles. So that sack was very, very important. Um, one, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I've done them all. Just checking. Right. So a typical day in the trenches would look a little bit like this. So you can see them all all asleep during the daytime there. Um, so at five a.m. They would be on high alert to make sure that no one was attacking them. Um, at half past five, they would have a little drink of rum, um, calm the nerves. At six o'clock, they would stand down and start to relax a little bit. At 7 a.m., they would have breakfast, which usually consisted of bacon and tea, but later on would have stale bread and possibly water. Um, after breakfast, they would clean their weapons and make sure the trench is tidy as long as it's not dirty, wet, and blooded, they could at least have it a little bit tidy. They would at noon have dinner, then after dinner, they would have a little have a little kip, have a little nap, make sure they are ready. And when it comes to after tea time, they would when the sun starts to set, they would be on guard just in case they decide to attack. And then from half six onwards, they'll do all the jobs that they need. So patrols, so making sure no one comes, digging trenches and putting got barbed wire or getting stores, so getting supplies. Um, 
So again, we covered the Christmas truce last lesson. That was just a day when everyone stopped fighting on Christmas Day, played football and celebrated Christmas. It was And it was quite nice. Um, right, so I go back to this. So that one was live in general. So again, if you look in the description of this video, you can look in a bit more detail and there are some things for you to listen to as well to get more of a sense of what it was like. So when the order was issued to go over the top, it was quite terrifying because you didn't know what you were going, you didn't know what would happen. As soon as you go over the top, you are completely exposed. So you are exposed to gunfire, shelling, and all sorts. And they'll often go, they'll often go in waves. So the first wave will go, the second wave, and then the third wave. As you're running, um, as you're running over, you are constantly being shot at and attacked. So it's so running across no man's land was very tricky and it was very risky. And a lot of people died that way, sadly, because it was quite a new type of warfare with the machine guns. They were quite new. So a lot the, a lot of the first wave would be picked up quite easily. And as they were as they were reloading, the second wave would go over, and that's when more likely. And when or when they got to, into the other person's, other person's trenches, obviously if if they're too close to fire the gun, they would use the bayonet instead. So again, you can imagine just how terrifying that was. So it's extremely dangerous, and you're never quite sure when it was going to happen. Obviously, it must have been very tricky to follow these orders, but people were very eager to fight. They're, yes, they're very scared, but they were also very eager to fight. Um, partly because if they didn't, they would face punishments. If they if they were accused of being cowards, as if they didn't want to fight, they would face punishments, such as being executed by their own side, so being killed by their own side. Um, when they were recruiting, they were looking for men to stand up and be counted. As the war went on, they were, they were in, I won't say encouraged, but they were asked to join. And, and if they didn't, then they would possibly shame their family and shame themselves um, to the point where they would have to go because life, be, life wouldn't be great at home because you'd be constantly getting looks and constantly being called a coward. So eventually they would go because it was just easier. Um, so, in those times as well, obviously, these are quite traumatic, and in those times, mental conditions weren't really diagnosed. Um, so people came back suffering from shell shock. So when they heard loud bangs, they were scared because they thought they were back at the war. But people, people mistook that for cowardice, and so many were executed that way, which is obviously quite a sad state of affairs. Right, so... What you should do is write this letter describing what life is like in the trenches. So what is it like in trenches? I mentioned it's, it's wet, it's, especially in the winter, it's wet, it's muddy, it's horrible. Have you done any fighting? So what, what would we be like to go over the top of the trench and run towards the German side? Um, have any of your friends, what are your friends like? Have any been hurt or killed? What sort of things do you eat? So again, write it as if it was later in the war you're getting cold soup, which, which isn't very nice. How do you sleep? You sleep during the daytime, you haven't got beds, you haven't got a mattress, you haven't got a pillow, you just sleep where you can. So it's not going to be very pleasant, is it? So write, write a letter about how life was like. So we've got the address up here, we've got a date, 1917, because that's it's wartime, so it's quite late on in the war, so think about what sort of food, be, what sort of food you'll be getting. Got an address up there, and we've got, Dear Mum, I miss you so much. The trench, so on, life in the trench is what? So I miss you so much. Comma, life in the trench, etc. So, what was life like? And then try and answer some of these questions as if you are a soldier writing it. And then from your loving son or daughter, well, well woman would it be son because. Women would women wouldn't be fighting in the um on the front line to be son. Look, from your loving son, David. So 
I look forward to reading some of your letters. Again, I'll put the, I'll put that website link in the description so you can read it yourself and listen to some of the audio because it won't work in this video. Um, and that site will help you quite a lot. So I'm looking forward to hearing to some. I'm looking forward to hearing some listening, reading. Get that right. Looking forward to reading some of your wonderful letters. Bye and have a good day.